My preference would be that this be sort of more of a conversation than a lecture, since there are, just aren't that many of you, and I'm assuming that each of you came with some questions in mind. So feel free to ask questions as we go. Is that all right with you, Paige? OK. Um, I'll start off with talking about self-harm. I'll try not to make that noise again. Um, and then suicide, which is related somewhat closely. Uh, Co-occurring disorders, just so that you're aware of what else is out there that comes with self-harm a lot of the time. Um, uh, some of the treatment ideas around self-harm, and then referrals and what to do. Is there any chance that I could ask you six to kind of tell me who you are and what brought you here so that we can tailor it a little bit? I, I know you. Yeah, I'm Shelley Boyd. I'm with Millard Public Schools, and we just work with a lot of kids and parents who are in need of direct service and ideas and the things that you're going to address in terms of treatments and referrals. Okay. And what we need to do to work with our kids more, most effectively sure. in the school setting. So okay. Okay. And does yeah. that, okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, Come I'm on Christina in. I'm Christina Nemec and I uh, work with the Nebraska Children's Home Society. Okay. Um, I'm a parenting or pregnancy parenting and adoption caseworker so sometimes you know we see some of this, but not a ton, but I just thought it'd be good information. So. Okay. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. And I'm just know a young lady who I would just like to give information about. Sure. With my sister, we thought we would. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we'll try to address this to sort of all levels. Let me first give you a definition of self-harm. Um, People come at this from all kinds of angles. Um, if you're familiar with it, you might have heard of it before. If you haven't, a lot of people, the first response is, why on earth would anybody ever deliberately harm themselves? It makes no sense. Um, it's a deliberate, intentional injury to one's own body that causes tissue damage or leaves marks for more than a few minutes, uh, often scars, depending, um, which is done to cope with an overwhelming or distressing situation. The technical term is non-suicidal self-injury, NSSI, which I thought was kind of cool. I found that out as I was researching this. I'm still going to call it self-harm throughout the talk, but that's the official term. Um, but let me stress again, the self-harm, the intention is to cope. It's not to kill. That's a, it's a point I'll be covering again later, but uh-oh. There we go. So here's where we go. Um, if you're talking about somebody using a razor blade, cutting across the vein, cutting up the vein, it's possible for them to kill themselves, even when the intention was not to. But usually self-injury is not an attempt at suicide. It's not an attempt to kill themselves. Um, that said, it's really important to get people assessed because most people who, many people who self-arm will at some point think about suicide. Just be aware, you've got increased risk once you've got self-harm. Questions on that? No. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the prevalence rates first of self-harm behaviors and then talking more about suicide in addition to that. Um, we know that the rates seem to vary between 4 and 15 percent across the board. However, there are some studies out there that get as high as about 46 percent depending on um, certain factors like how it's defined and the population they're looking at and the time frame that they're looking at as well. So. For instance, some studies might look at, OK, are you doing this repeatedly? Or have you ever done this in your life? So there is some variability. Um, I apologize for referring my paper here, but um, there's a bunch of studies with different numbers. So I'm going to do that. Um, but I think overall, um, the international rates seem to be pretty comparable to the US rates. Um, for instance, there was a study that's looking at a 
um, ninth graders and they found about 11% reported self-harming um, and 4% reported repeatedly self-harming. So there's this trend across the board of 11% um, have done it maybe once or twice, whereas those lower numbers have done it repeatedly. Do you have a question? Numbers on the rise. I mean, it just seems like I don't remember this being an issue when I was a teenager. Is this something that's really rising right now? Um, I'm going to pass that along to Rio. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think it's brand new, but I think it's much more um, contagious than anything ever used to be. Now that you've got social networking and tumbling and tweeting and all these other ways to convey information and communicate, hey, this is something I've tried and I like it, you want to join. And it also seems to depend a little bit at that age range that you're looking at, too. For those of you working in middle schools, you might see higher rates than your colleagues who work in elementary schools might see. So there is a variability, but um, the rates seem to hover around this between 4 and 15 percent. Um, and that leads us to suicide prevalence rates. Uh, we know that for adolescents, suicide is the third leading cause of death. Um, and I think that's behind like accidents and homicides, which we can see the common theme of all these things are preventable, unfortunately. Um, so we have about 12% for the age range between 15 and 24 year olds. Um, and the rates of completed suicides and attempted suicides might increase from childhood to adolescence. So like I said, with self-harm, we see that increase around adolescence for risk of suicidality. Is that higher than it used to be too or not? The, the suicide rates have gone, they went way up and peaked, I believe in the either the mid 80s or the early 90s, and they're actually coming back down a little bit. So what are the predictors of suicide? Um, shockingly, depression is the number one predictor. We know that youth who are depressed are 14 times more likely um, to attempt suicide than kids who are not. Um, and then we have over 50% 50, 50 of kids who have depression um, will attempt suicide. Fortunately, out of that number, only about 7% will actually succeed, but it's kind of shocking and um, not good that over 50% of kids who are depressed will attempt. Um, and the single most predictor, the single most powerful predictor for attempting is a previous attempt. So we really want to take into account that history and make sure um, that we are noticing if kids have attempted before or thought about suicide before. So a lot of the research has looked at the gender differences um, between girls and boys in these behaviors. And some of you might know this already, but women are three, more, three times more likely to attempt suicide than men. But on the flip side, men are much more likely than women to actually successfully, or quote, unquote, successfully complete suicide. Um, so some, some researchers think that this is because men are using more lethal methods to do that than women. Um, and when you break down different ethnicities, um, the population that has the highest suicide rates are American Indians and Alaskan Natives. So again, these are just risk factors. Obviously, we can see both genders and lots of different ethnicities partaking in these behaviors. So the most important takeaway here is that if you know a child or adolescent who is suicidal, you need to refer them because there's mo most likely underlying issues such as depression going on, and they might even be self-harming. Um, so these are just some sources that you can um, find referral and outpatient treatment for them through. So we have pediatricians, psychologists, um, school psychologists, people in the community, um, like other counselors, and people like that who can help address these issues. Types of self-harm. There are all kinds of ways that you can inflict damage on your body. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to get a, a little Graphic, I'll try not to get too graphic because I realize you are eating and there might be meat in the sandwiches. <laughs> I don't know. Um, cutting is the one that generally kind of pops to mind. 
Um, a lot of kids use scissors or razors. That's sort of the, the most common that I've seen. Um, branding, friction burns. If you take an eraser and you rub it on your skin fast enough, you can get a nice burn. Uh, uh, not, you know, pardon my calling it a nice burn. Um, you can pick at the skin and get it to bleed if you pick hard enough. Um, hair pulling if it's to inflict damage. Um, hitting with, with any kind of hard object just to see if they can get that bruise going. Um, multiple piercing or tattooing if, if it follows that definition of self-injury, if, if it's about pain or stress relief. Um, it's not, uh, multiple piercings and tattooings don't necessarily mean that this is a self-harmer. Um, drinking harmful chemicals, uh, taking pills, you could probably fit in that category. And then here are some of the reasons that, that researchers have found and that I have heard personally over the years working with self-harmers. Um, they say it makes the pain go away, or it makes me not think about the pain. Um, I've heard people say it makes the pain real, and I can, I can see it on my body, so I know the pain is real. Um, to communicate emotional pain to others, you, sometimes it's really obvious, you know, they'll carve the word help, or they'll carve an obscenity on their arm. Um, a lot of the time it's less obvious, it's just, cuts. Um, there are two types of self-harmers that I have run into. There's the kind that feels pain when they self-injure, and there's the kind that doesn't. They actually feel relief, they feel soothed, they feel better when they're harming themselves. Um, there is there's a theory about endorphins being released and um, and they just kind of get more tolerant of the pain so it doesn't hurt anymore. Yes? So the purpose of your self-harmers that are not feeling the pain? They're still feeling emotional pain and looking to right. fix that. So what relief is the self-harm giving them if they're not getting that pain relief, so to speak? You know what I mean? If, if you have your self-harmers that aren't feeling the pain mm -hmm. and the payoff sometimes is the pain, mm -hmm. what is their payoff? if they're not feeling the pain? Sure, payoff could be just the fact that they're damaging themselves, they're indicating worthlessness. Um, seeing the blood pop up can be a payoff. Um, the endorphins still get released even if they're not, even if they say it doesn't hurt. So they're still getting that payoff of the endorphins and right. of the physical sight of their harm. Right. They just don't feel it. Right. Like, okay. Um, and some, with some of these kids, this is the only kind of sense of control they have over their lives. You know, I can't control my friends, I can't control my parents, my classes are hard, but I can, this I can do. Um, even more, self-punishment. There, there are some kids who will do that, you know, I, um, I got a B on my test today, and there's another mark on the arm, or I, hurt somebody's feelings today and there's another mark. Um, habit and addictive qualities we've talked about a little bit that, that sort of over time it can become a, a habit. It, beca it can become kind of an addiction. You know that the thing, that doing the thing is gonna make the pain go away. So you're gonna keep doing it every time you have emotional pain. Social contagion, like I was mentioning earlier, you think about Tumblr and these competitions to get as many people as possible to follow you. And the more followers you have, the more Facebook friends you have, the better it is for some reason. And then if you're cutting and posting that, whether it's pictures or, you know, hey, I cut today because whatever, then think about all the followers that are reading that. Um, generally, these are people who are experiencing stressors. Too much going on in their lives, family conflict, um, conflict with peers, with boyfriends, with girlfriends, um, feeling alone, um, being criticized by parents. These can all kind of set somebody off. Um, 
OK, so I'll talk a little more about who self-harms specifically. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, but adolescents are more at risk than younger children and adults. So we have that 12 to 16-year-old age range that is sort of at risk, or more so at risk. Um, females might have higher rates of self-harm, although there's other research that says this might not be the case, and there might be um, a little more even a gender comparison there where males might be equally, equally as likely, but most of the studies are saying that females are more highly at risk. And then there's also some inconsistent research on race and ethnicity, although being a sexual minority is a higher risk factor for self-harm. I see some nodding heads. Is that something that you've been exposed to in the schools? Okay. And this is just a summary of additional risk factors. Like I said, that gender component, um, low SES and other stressors. Um, like Dr. Newring said, if you have that constant stress, you're sort of looking for an outlet to cope with it. Um, the presence of psychiatric disorders, and we see self-harm is associated with a lot of different disorders, such as substance abuse, um, depression, anxiety, eating disorders. So it's not always that self-harm is associated with depression. It could be these other issues as well. And then um, a student might have an inherited vulnerability to self-harming. Um, so if parents or uh, other family members are prone to depression or some of these other issues, you might be more likely to see them self-harming. And then high levels of parental criticism have also been found to be associated with self-harm as well. And then as Dr. Newring said, the influences of the peers and media, so that social contagion effect. So how do you know that this kid, these are some, these are some sort of tips for being able to tell um, this isn't a comprehensive list, and some of these kids are really good at hiding it. Um, but attempts to cover up, you'll see like long sleeves in the summertime, or you know those, um, those very wide bracelets that are so popular, and they're all up and down the wrist. Um, that, can, that can do a nice job covering up some cuts. Um, some, some um, we'll cut in areas that are really that are really hideable. Um, there's a there's a little line on the hip where the underwear covers or the bathing suit will cover. Nobody will ever know about that line unless you, unless they see that the naked hip, um, the stomach, uh, the lower chest. Those are places where self harm can be done and and you won't see it. Um, if you notice a kid having really really extreme um, sad emotions, ang anxiety, uh, emotional numbness. Um, the self-harm can, can help with managing those feelings or with um, allowing the person to feel it physically instead of emotionally. If you are in somebody's room and you notice there's a pair of scissors out, just kind of left open, if you notice that there's, there are razors anywhere other than the bathroom, th those could be signs as well. Be aware, people who are self-harming usually ha often have other things going on with them, whether it's depression, anxiety, this is stuff that Paige already covered, but um, eating disorders, those are kind of the top three. Uh, bipolar disorders, substance abuse, borderline personality, um, somebody who's experienced prior abuse or trauma, um, very poor body image, uh, generally, self-harm doesn't come out of a vacuum. There are other problems present. All right. So I'm going to talk about the symptoms of these comorbid conditions. Um, so first, I'll start with depression. And I'll talk about these symptoms more generally. And then on the next slide, I'll go into further detail about what depression might look like in adolescents in particular. So. Shockingly, for depression, we have sad mood. Um, so the kid who might be crying a lot or feeling really down most of the time, that would be a red flag. 
Um, additionally, we have loss of interest, especially in activities that kids used to be interested in. If they suddenly feel like they're not that into them anymore, that might be something to look for as well. Um, sleep problems and appetite changes. For these two things, we kind of look for those extremes. So if the kid is overeating or um, has a loss of appetite, that would be a red flag. And the same thing with sleep. If they're sleeping a lot or having difficulty sleeping, um, that's also a symptom of depression. Um, feeling restless or slowed down. Fatigue, again, um, it can be physically draining as well if you're emotionally burdened all the time by this sadness. Um, so that's a symptom that comes up often. And we also have kids who are depressed report con uh, concentration difficulties. So this gets tricky when in a school setting, um, teachers might be saying, oh, this kid never pays attention. They must have ADHD when really they might be more of a depressed child or adolescent. Um, feelings of worthlessness or guilt. So these are really feelings um, that are pervasive and the adolescent might say, this is never going to get better for me. I'm always going to be terrible at everything. Um, so you can see how they could take these negative beliefs and perceive them to be really global and not, not changing and not going to get better. Um, and finally, we have the presence of suicidality and thoughts of death, which is a really, um, big component of depression for lots of adolescents. So here's that more specific adolescent component of what depression might look like. Um, it might, instead of depressed mood or that sad mood that I referred to earlier in the other slide, we might see a lot more irritability. So um, if parents are saying, oh, my adolescent is always bickering with me or doesn't smile anymore, that's something to look for. Uh, we also have somatic complaints, um, so it might be their stomach's upset, they're getting headaches, because um, emotions can express themselves in a physical form. So that's why we have somatic complaints on there. Um, social withdrawal, if an adolescent is feeling isolated um, from their peers or not reporting friendships or they're staying in their room a lot, that's um, also a sign of depression especially because during adolescence is when is the time in which peers become such an important factor in their life. So when you're seeing it kind of go the other way, it's something that is concerning usually. Um, decrease in grades um, as well. So the main takeaway here is if the depressed mood is interfering with their functioning in some way. So this is not the kid who um, is you know, feeling bad one day and bounces back really quickly. This is the adolescent who is having problems in school, problems with peers, problems at home, that we really start to get concerned about a diagnosis. Um, however, depression can also be associated with these other problems, um, and these are just a few of them. So disruptive behavior disorders, it might come out more externally that they're getting into fights or um, you know, more observable behaviors than just seeing a kid kind of look alone and isolated. Uh, attention deficit disorders, anxiety disorders, substance-related disorders, eating disorders, and self-harm. So for the last three, um, these might be attempts to cope with the depression that they're feeling. Next, moving into anxiety, this is what we think of as excessive fear to the point where um, their worry or fear um, really causes a lot of distress and results in adolescents wanting to avoid that feared stimulus. So the symptoms of anxiety are typically racing thoughts. They're constantly worried about something. Um, again, irritability, difficulty sleeping, um, obsessions and compulsions. So an example of this is the child who might wash their hands all the time for being afraid of getting germs on them or something. Um, and then physiological symptoms as well. So um, shortness of breath, sweaty palms. I mean, we can all think of those times that we were feeling anxious about something. So um, this subset of kids who are anxious feel, feel those more often than not. And for anxiety, we have um, a couple different kinds. Uh, we call generalized anxiety, worry about a lot of things. So this is 
referring to a child or adolescent who might be worried about most things. They're constantly voicing these worries um, and they kind of don't go away. Um, and then we have more specific worries um, or phobias as we call them sometimes if it's something like you know, fear of snakes or something that's very specific. Um, and other common ones are social anxiety, so being afraid of being in uh, situations where they're, it's social situations more or less where they're with other peers or standing in front of people talking or something like that. And then separation anxiety, which we sometimes see in younger kids where they're just afraid to go to school and leave mom or dad, um, kind of like that. Moving on to disordered eating. Um, this is more common in adolescents as well, um, particularly females. Um, and it's really uh, what characterizes disordered eating is restricting food intake to kind of um, keep their weight a certain way. So they're afraid of being overweight, um, which makes it difficult for them to maintain a normal weight. And they do this in unhealthy eating habits that go beyond just normal dieting. So what disordered eating could look like is binging and purging. So binging is when you're eating an excessive amount of food um, and you kind of feel like you don't have control over how much you're eating. On the flip side of that, there's these um, compensating mechanisms where adolescents might try to um, compensate for eating that much or restrict, um, as I said, their food intake or fast or take laxatives or they're going to the gym three hours a day. Uh, so those are some examples of that purging side of the coin. Um, and the important thing here is that individuals who are engaging in these behaviors might really minimize them, um, and they might be very good at hiding the, these behaviors as well. So this is important to think about in the context of self-harm. So if a child or adolescent is self-harming, they might also be engaging in these other sort of coping things that aren't really coping. Um, so they might be self-harming one day and purging another day. Um, so it's really important to think about the fact that they might be hiding those behaviors. The good news is um, most people who self-harm grow out of it at some point. Um, the biggest component to that is they have to find a reason not to. So some reasons not to are just, just kind of outgrowing it. Um, you know, it gets harder as you have more people around. I'm sure if you have a family and children, it would be really hard to find the time and the space to do it. Um, a lot of self-harmers find other ways to get their needs met, um, other kinds of ways to cope. Um, it's, you're doing damage to your body, which is a concern for some of them. They realize that this is not a good thing to be doing, hurting their, hurting their bodies. So they become more concerned with physical health and find other ways to cope. Um, the overwhelming shame or secrecy, a lot of self-harmers really are so ashamed of what they do. They do it, they feel the relief, and then they hide it for all they're worth and they hate it, and they hate themselves. Um, and if that hate, that self-hate can get strong enough, then maybe it can sort of outweigh the self-harming urge. Um, disliking physical scars. It, you know, it's one thing during the winter, but then when you gotta wear your bathing suit, it's a whole nother ball of wax. Um, and some people just no longer find it helpful. They, they, they keep trying it for a while and then it stops working. The, when I think about self-harm, I think about it's a behavior that gets a need met. That's, that's what we're talking about. So how else could this person get their needs met? is what I'm coming into the, into the therapy room with. Um, if they need to be doing something with their hands, is there something healthy they could be doing with their hands? Painting, journaling, uh, modeling with clay. Do they need to just have a koosh ball in their hands so that they can always be fidgeting? Um, 
or coping strategies that serve the same function. If it's to make the, if, if, it's, if it's to distract them from the pain, is there something else they could do to distract themselves from the emotional pain that they're feeling? Um, it's very helpful to identify the emotional triggers. What are the situations that make cutting more likely? Is it that every time this kid gets in a fight with her dad, she's going to go upstairs and cut? Um, every time there's a breakup, is she going to go upstairs and cut? Um, once you know the situations that are most likely to trigger it, you can do some preventive work or some problem solving around those situations. Um, making goals for short time periods and then expanding the time periods. Have any of you heard of the Butterfly Project? No. Yes? No? OK. Um, the Butterfly Project was started by some people who were trying to stop self-harming. And what they would do is they would draw on the area where they, where they self-harm a picture of a butterfly. And while the picture of the butterfly was there, they would not hurt it. They wouldn't kill the butterfly. They wouldn't hurt the butterfly. So as long as that ink stayed on the body, the body was safe. Um, and then you think about different kinds of ink, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But, but at least then you can get a little while where the skin is not damaged. Um, so I think about permanent markers. I think about tattoos. Um, you would be surprised the number of people who have tattoos right here or right here. Um, but so I'll start with, with, you know, hey, maybe could you, could you not do it just for this 24 hours, just from 6.30 tonight until 6.30 tomorrow night? Could you abstain from it? And then maybe if that works OK, then maybe could we do it from 6.30 on Wednesday to 6.30 on Friday? Is that possible? Um, using imagery, distraction, generally it's this wave of really intense emotional pain that comes over them, and that's when they're going to do it. If they can distract during, that wave will generally pass at some point. Um, if you're going to use any kind of other skill, you want to be fluent in it. Uh, it's no good if you, if you teach this kid to do deep breathing and then they're, they're caught up in this horrible emotional pain, they're not going to remember to do deep breathing. If they practice it every single day, they'll be more fluent with it. It'll be sort of on the tip of their tongue to do. When they go to self-harm, they can say, wait, I do know one other thing that I could do. Any questions so far? So and then this is aimed at you guys. Um, again, th this is a behavior that serves a function, that the kid gets something out of it. Um, you have to find another way to get that function served other than the self-harm. Um, and although we've really emphasized there are all these co-occurring disorders, you can get somebody who's really high functioning and still self-harming. You know, the kid who gets straight A's, gets along great with her parents, has a nice support group of friends, does, does you know, two sports, um, can still be the one sitting across from me in my office saying, I've been self-harming for a year and I've never disclosed to anyone. Um, be genuine, be non-judgmental. Because there's so much shame and guilt around self-harming, you really don't want to exacerbate that by Ooh, why would you do? That's disgusting. I mean, these are. Um, listen, listen to what they have to say about why they're doing what they're doing. Use a respectfully curious demeanor as much as you can. Um, when I am assessing, if I know a kid is coming in to see me for self harm, I will ask questions like, how often do you do it? When was the last time you did it? Uh, what do you use? Do you use a razor or scissors or you know any sharp object that's around? And I've heard some weird ones. You know, even um, the tip of a pencil. If you pull the eraser out, you can get a really nice sharp edge out of that out of that metal part. Um, I'll ask them if the blood bubbles up to the surface like a cat scratch or if it drips, trying to get at sort of how deep are they going. Um, 
it's that's one of the things that I use. You know, if they're saying they can see the bone, you, you've got another problem. Send them to the ER. <laughs> Done. Um, encourage them to express themselves appropriately. So you're distressed. So you have some problems. Do you want to talk about those? That would be an appropriate emotional expression. Do you want to go work out? Um, and certainly encourage them to get help, get them assessed, um, get them into therapy, get them into some kind of treatment or, or group or support. Try not to, and I say try not to because I realize that it's difficult, especially if you're a parent. Um, but the anger, the fear, the disappointment, those are things that are going to set them off even more. Um, it causes further guilt and shame, and it can, make, it can make the behaviors go even farther underground, which is not what you want. Um, take this with a grain of salt. I primarily do therapy with adolescents. So I'm seeing the kids that we've been describing to you so far today. Um, my view of normal versus abnormal is a little skewed, but I think of cutting as a normal behavior. It's not OK, but it's a fairly normal teenage behavior. You heard Paige talk about the statistics. This is something that a lot of people are doing. It's not OK, just like drugs and sex and driving too fast and getting into fights are not OK. Cutting kind of falls into that category. A lot of people are doing it. It's horrifying for anyone who's not in their generation to think that it could be a normal behavior, but it is for their generation. Um, I'm going to put in a plug for my clinic, of course. You guys have other resources as well. Um, at Children's Behavioral Health, we do have people who prescribe meds. We have therapists and counselors and psychologists. That's the phone number. <laughs> it's, uh, it should be on your PowerPoint slides. Um, you can look up therapist, counselor, psychologist in the yellow pages. You can look it up online. Um, but get the kid in to see, a, to see a therapist if you're finding out they're doing some self-harm. Just wanted to mention there are different levels of treatment. It might be the treatment that, that a child who is self-harming receives could be anywhere from outpatient, you know, once a week, they have a 50-minute session, or even once a month, they have a 50-minute session. Intensive outpatient is more like two to three times a week they have sessions. Um, generally, if it's just cutting and there's no wish for death or attempts to die, you'll get in one of those, two first, those first two categories. Um, day treatment is more like three to five hours, three to five days a week. So you're talking a much more intensive program for much more severe behaviors. Uh, brief in, inpatient. If the kid is cutting and says, I, I was actually trying to get all the way through this time, um, you're talking Emmanuel Mercy, Brian LGH hospitalization. The outpatient, intensive outpatient day treatment? Yes. Um, they're available, but they're hard to find and they're hard to get into, is what I'm finding with some of my clients these days. Um, the intensive outpatient is probably your, your best bet if you can find a psychologist who will do that, or a counselor who will do that. The day treatment, it's much harder to get into unless there's some hint of suicidality. Other questions? So things that you can be looking for. Um, look for signs of mental illness. Look for severe depression, severe anxiety. Um, look for so, sort of sudden isolation. You know, somebody who used to be more social is now withdrawing. Um, somebody who used to be real comfortable with their body is now covering up. Um, that might be normal teenager. That might be hiding some self-harm. Physical scarring or evidence of injury. Um, and you kind of have to know what to look for. 
uh, a few hints. If it's a design, it was done with intention. Um, I met a kid who had a perfect uh, diamond on her hand. And she had told her mom that she had burned herself uh, on some steam from making, a, making tea. And I took one look at it and said, no, that's not, what, that's not what an accidental burn scar looks like. And then she asked her mother to leave the room and copped. Um, and again, I know I've said this about four different times, but this, they're not trying to kill themselves. They're trying to feel better. They're trying to cope with the emotions that they feel. Um, don't, don't be afraid to talk about it. They may be, I was going to say, they may be dying to talk about it with you. That's a bad phrase. But they may really be wanting to talk about, oh, I do this thing and I'm so ashamed and I'm so embarrassed. And by the time they've actually said that they do it, there's a huge weight lifted off of them. Um, help identify potential reasons for stopping. You know, these are the things that you are doing to your body. And, do you want to have scars? And is that something that you've thought about? Um, try to find replacement behaviors. Arrange access to therapy and treatment as soon as you can. What other questions do you guys have? I'm going to sort of scroll through the, these are some of the references. Uh, Paige and I were a little um, enthusiastic. Um, <laughs> Then this is my email. So if you have more questions that you're not comfortable talking about, you're welcome to email me. Yes. If you know exactly what they're doing, when, and what they're using, I mean, do you say, OK, you can't be in the bathroom alone. I'm going to be with you this time. If their underlying thing is it's like to control, like you're saying, could that just make it worse? Because now they're going to use something worse mm -hmm. later. Is it just going to backfire? Um, it could. Uh, did, did everyone hear the question? Okay. Um, it could backfire, most likely, if you're saying, I love you, I care about you, I don't want you hurting yourself, um, so I'm going to hang out with you. If I know you're having a really bad day, I'm going to hang out with you. Do you want to go get ice cream instead? <laughs> um, just try to sort of open up. Girls need to shave their legs. So it would be like basically me saying, you can't take a shower without me being right there if you want to shave your legs. Right. Um, and and if, I'm, if I'm really concerned about the level of self-harm, I will tell parents to check razors in and out. The child gets the razor as long as they're in the shower and then has to give it back. Using it for what you don't want them to use it for. I right. Mean, so do you just say, sorry, you can't shave your legs? You can. I mean, I just wonder that, like, if that can just end up backfiring because, like I said, then they're just going to look for something else, which could it as just something. Right. It, it can, which is, why, which is why suggestion number one is get them into therapy. Um, get, some, <laughs> get some help, um, some backup, somebody to, somebody to be helping to guide you and helping them sort of figure out what's going on. Yeah. To her question, though, mm -hmm. I mean, as if, if I were a parent with that kind of heightened concern, I, you know, without trying to necessarily be controlling yet protective, I think as a parent it would be okay for me to say to my daughter, yeah, you can shave, but I am going to be in the bathroom while you shave, and I'm going to give you the razor and take it from you when you're done. Mm -hmm. If I know that that's her planned time to hurt herself. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I guess to me, if I know it and don't, I feel like I'm somehow giving permission right. for her to do that. So I guess I would think that would be OK to impose myself on her cutting time, if that's her assigned cutting time, um, that or tell her you use Nair, right? Because right. that's a shaveless hair removal product. Right. Um, just take that chance, though, that you're not putting up that, you know, taking control Right. That's what, and I Every know it's child. that it's mm -hmm. that you know the balance the balance yeah. of yeah. of that. But um, I I guess I I think it I kind of liken it to the other 
the other factor, you know, the comorbidity things where mm -hmm. if I know my son or daughter's abusing a substance I have in the home, I'm going to remove the substance. Mm -hmm. right. I, I mean, that's just what I'm going to do. Right. Um, so I don't know. And there, and there might be other ways to give a child back a sense of control over their, over their life, over their environment. There might be other ways to do that right. besides letting yeah. them engage in. I, mean, I don't want to watch them shower. You know, that's not the goal, <laughs> but at the same time, I don't <laughs> Thank know you that for I saying would, that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that I would want to allow them. Yeah, if they're continue. telling me I cut myself every night right. in the shower, I would have a difficult time allowing unsupervised showers. I mean, I just would. Yeah. If they're telling me. if it's not right. the razor that they're using, right. it's going to be... Something else in the shower. Control. Right. It's going to be, I mean, and I hate to so, increase that paranoia, but right. I mean, but is that truly the case? If they're, I mean, they are serious self-harmers. They're going to figure out... A variety of different ways to inflict the pain and mm -hmm. I agree. generally yeah. speaking. Okay. So I guess going along with all of that, if you see that somebody is doing, um, I don't know, I guess um, more of a tamer form of self harm, like pulling the hair and things mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. is that do you see a high rate of them kind of, I guess, graduating to some of those more harmful right. behaviors like mm -hmm. cutting and, you know, those kinds of things. Um, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. The self-harmers that I know started about at the level that they got to. They didn't get they might have um, increased frequency, but not a lot, of, and maybe increased depth, but not, there's not a lot of graduating up instruments unless they don't have access to them. I, I feel like <laughs> most of the self-harmers I know have a favorite item that they go with, or a favorite form of self-injury that they go with. But you said you could give them control other ways. Yeah. How, how can you make this person that, if you're in the shower, you know, in the room where they're showering, how can they get their dignity or control back, you know, in a way? You know, you said make sure that they, you know, they want to be in control. These are adolescents. So, right, right. So what did you mean by they can still have control other ways? Or? Um, are there other ways you can give them back control? Can you let them choose their own classes? Can you let them um, choose their extracurricular activities or whether they're gonna do any? Um, can you give them a little more freedom out with friends? Um, not knowing the specifics of that particular kid, um, I don't know where the places are that, that, and, that any particular kid has lost control. But if there are other places that you can give them that control, that, I mean, that would be what to look for. Right. Right, right, and and some some parents are very controlling of their teenagers. You know, some do. Uh, you know, check the what's it called the power power school. Check their power school grades every day. Some check them every week. Um, that's that's a lot of control that a parent is putting over over an adolescent, and could be. I mean, could maybe be lessened, but but again, that sort of. Again, let me get the kid into therapy, see if you can get a decent therapist who's, who's going to help work on the issues with you and, and the kid. What else you got? I do have a question about kids that, um, because you talked about peers and how with the social media, you know, the following of things. Um, it, when you see the promotion of their activity, mm -hmm. if they're promoting it, advertising it, um, without being, you know, you don't want to necessarily be punishing of that behavior, but at the same time, if they're in the lunchroom, uh, really advertising it, um, <laughs> and, you know, allowing others to do the same, mm -hmm. and so then you have a grouping of kids engaged in the same behavior, mm -hmm. You know, how do you do that without it being a, a punishment, so to speak, or <coughs> without punishing that behavior? Not that they're cutting 
their, but they're advertising their cuts or their marks or their whatever mm -hmm. very much so that it is an advertisement of their activity. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's kind of a hard one without, right. you know, without being judgmental, without mm -hmm. being, you know, giving consequences for a behavior that, I mean. Sure. But this is where I would sort of go back to seeing cutting as another um, stupid teenage behavior sort of are they allowed to talk about the binge drinking that they did last weekend are they allowed to talk about how many sexual partners they had last weekend treat it the same way that you would treat those conversations i don't know how you treat those conversations typically can you discourage them no, no. right and try to break up that particular right, right right so i think you would probably do the same thing and then and then call the the people who were really obvious about i do this i'm proud of it call them in and ask them, sort of figure out if they need more further treatment or if they're in treatment already or what you need to do about them. Yeah. Other questions? I found that um, parents often are just so shocked and, oh my gosh, what do I do? You know, and they look for direction from you and, you know, we have ideas and suggestions for them, but I think sometimes too then, well, you give them, like in our school district, we have referral sources on our web page, and mm -hmm. you know it's at your expense, but you you know really should. And then you wonder sometimes, did they do it? Did they follow up? And like you know, and how pushy do you get? You know, did you guys find somebody that, or you know, how how much do you impose on their private family life by making sure that your students or whatever are having their needs met or getting getting the help they need. Sure. You know, you can see if it's still continuing to affect things or be an issue at school because those kids talk. Um, but at the same time, the parents really often are lost. Sure. Um, and I don't know what, what your school policies are on like contacting parents after you've been in contact with them before. Um, but you could probably do a follow-up call a month later and say, hey, how's that going? Have you found a provider? Mm -hmm. Do you need any more help? At what point do you become a neglect issue? <laughs> <laughs> um, Second day. A <laughs> couple of liters of blood? I'm not sure. I'm, I mean, it's, it's, this is where sort of your policy is your policy. But it, it does become a neglect issue, um, depending on how severe the self-harm is. If you're really worried about that kid, if they're doing enough damage to really lose some blood, you want to follow up immediately. And if the parents don't follow through, you can say to them, I'm going to have to call CPS. This kid needs care. And they can become even better at hiding it. And then you don't really realize it's and maybe it's getting taken care of and isn't really an issue anymore. I haven't heard anything or. Right. And then again, again, I think later it would, if it was an issue, end up surfacing somewhere or be talked about, that somebody would I be alerted so. to it again. <laughs> but I don't, I don't think there's, I, I, I don't know what your policies are, but I would think a follow-up call would be, yeah, and, and enough to sort of soothe you, yeah. maybe help the parent out again if they've lost the numbers that you gave them or forgotten the resources. I hear that kind of stuff all the time. Yeah, I have a question. First, I apologize for being late. I thought it was a different time than what I wrote down. Um, but so I missed the very first part of the uh, class here. But was there any talk about medication usage? No. You mean uh, as a treatment for self harm, or do you mean as a form of self harm? As a treatment for self harm. No, we, we did, I didn't actually go into treatments very much at all because um, because I don't think it's a good idea to use a lot of home remedies for self for self injury. Um, medications can help depression, they can help anxiety, they can help those comorbid conditions. Um, for cutting itself, I think the most researched treatment would be DBT, dialectical behavior therapy. Um, if you can find somebody who does that, that's specifically geared toward self-harm, and there's a lot of research on that one. Um, but other forms of therapy can work as well. Um, 
if the medication works for the kid in terms of alleviating the emotions, you would think that it would work for the self-harm. But I don't know that there have been studies on medications for self-harm. Do you know of any? Mm -mm. I'm not sure of any. Okay. My child is in therapy right now. Mm -hmm. And it's not a cutting situation, though. There's some other things involved. But um, I'm having issues where I feel that they need to be on medicine. Mm -hmm. But the pediatrician feels the same, but the psychiatrist doesn't feel that medicine is needed any longer. Mm -hmm. And where do you go with that? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> either you. I'm not saying long term, forever on medicine, mm -hmm. but at least until things can figured out, be figured out a little sure. bit better. At least I feel as a parent, I'm more comfortable having the child on a medicine mm -hmm. <laughs> versus not. In that case, you can switch providers until you find somebody who who gives you a treatment that you feel is appropriate. Um, that will take more of a sense of control away from the kid if you're sort of yanking them to a different therapist. But um, I, it's, again, it's sort of a balance. If you feel that way and the pediatrician th feels that way, that's some, some serious weight on the side of taking the meds. Um, if the psychiatrist thinks they don't need it, the psychiatrist is trained in mood disorders, I, would, I mean, that's a pretty tough call. Um, maybe you could meet with the provider and talk about why they don't think medication is a good idea. I mean, if that's, if that's a case where the kid feels less in control because they have to take a pill now, or they feel sicker or more crazy because they have to take a pill now, that might be a, a sign against taking it. Does that help you at all? <laughs> <laughs> it's a complicated situation. Yeah, to go to a different provider, because this provider feels that basically the child is old enough to make their decision. Mm -hmm. He doesn't feel that that child should be forced to take mm -hmm. something. And I guess the question that I might have you mull over is what does the child feel is warranted? I don't want to take that at all. And how many battles do you want to fight over that? Yeah. Other questions? Well, we're just about out of time. I guess Paige and I will be here for a couple more minutes if you guys mm -hmm. want to ask any more questions up close. Otherwise, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.